Hey everybody, right now you're hearing sounds from my new Ableton Live Pack, Guitar Feedback. Guitar Feedback has 210 guitar feedback sounds, pick scrapes, and slides that are really useful for transitional changes in your music. There's also 25 Ableton Live instrument presets that allow you to use these sounds as melodic instruments. All of the lead sounds you're hearing right now are made with the pack. You can find this at my website, brianfunk.com. It's also part of the September 2021 downloads for the Music Production Club. And I'm really excited to announce that I can now offer your first month for free at the Music Production Club. In the Music Production Club, you get all kinds of downloads for your music production needs, educational stuff, Ableton Live Pack stuff, templates, and there's an online community and we do live classes. And every month you get something new. You can go to brianfunk.com slash mpc to join the Music Production Club and get your first month free. You'll get a whole bunch of downloads, including the guitar feedback Ableton Live Pack. And of course, if the club is not for you, you can cancel at any time and keep everything. So check out the Music Production Club, brianfunk.com slash mpc. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. And on today's show, I have a special guest. Alark is here with me. She is a singer, songwriter, producer. She's a musical coach. She's doing a lot of cool stuff with her music, with her own live performances, and also helping fellow musicians reach their own musical goals and find their own sound and their own personality. And that's something I'm actually really excited to talk about because I think that's what sets people apart is finding their own style and sound that helps you uh, be identifiable and all that good stuff. I've had some conversation about that recently, actually, too. So it's fun to pick up on that. So thank you very much for being on the show, Lark. Cool. Th- thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here. So thanks for having me. It's going to be cool. Yeah, it should be fun. Um, I think uh, what you're doing is really cool. You've got a nice sound. You've, you've got training in like opera, right? So yep. it's... It's cool to hear like how something like that, a more traditional type of thing, is coming together with more like modern futuristic sounds. Do yeah. You f- do you find that is that like a tough thing to put together? Is it just more like your natural style? No, it's been tough for me, um, and that's why I'm really passionate about the work that I do because I created because it was I created something that I was looking for help with. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in terms of applying opera training and singing and performing to like dance music and pop music. Some of the things I've been experimenting with have just been singing, uh, just big like phrases, operatic phrases, and then sampling them and putting them uh, in the backgrounds of songs or like cutting them up into little clips and programming them in, or also um, reinterpreting them and putting them to, uh, like keeping the same melodic line, same mm. text, maybe transposing uh, Verdi and Rossini, and then putting it to um, you know a produced track that my friend wrote, my friend Elkin Powell wrote, for example, mm. with a project called Elkin and Lark, as right. an example. It's nice. I, I can imagine actually like some of like the operatic runs and things could be cool for like ad lib style vocals and kind of filling out like decorating tracks. Yeah, I haven't done that. Hmm. Um, but thanks for the idea. <laughs> yeah, cool. I'm kind of glad, you know, not that I want you to be struggling or anything, but I'm kind of glad to hear that it wasn't easy for you to find, you know, that own, that sound and that style because I think it's something a lot of people struggle with. And something I think about all the time is like, what makes me, me? And like, how do I not, sometimes what what makes us, us as people is our imperfections and the like little quirks about us. And it's so easy sometimes to edit that out and erase your personality. It's hard to know like where to draw the line and where to strike a nice balance with that. Yeah. So for you to say even, because I think like your your background is pretty diverse and interesting and unique. It's still nice to hear that it wasn't just like, oh, well, I've got these like different things and it's nice and easy for me. It just fits right together. No, it's been a long, uh, it's been a long and winding road, um, <laughs> but totally worth it and, and uh, fulfilling. Hmm. 
mm. ultimately. Yeah. Were there any uh, like breakthrough moments that stick out in your head where you kind of like realized you were onto something? Well, I think the easiest thing to do would be like take it back. So I started doing theater and film as a child um, and then got into singing opera and classical music while I was also doing pop. And then I went to school for that at, uh, McGill in Montreal, the Schulich School of Music. I'm from the States, but I went to school there and would do that internationally in Austria and Italy, you know, mm -hmm. Kennedy Center, Carnegie Hall kinds of stuff. Um, and, but that wasn't for me. And so I came into gypsy jazz singing and then had a career in New York being a gypsy jazz singer. And then while I was doing that, I was also working at a music studio in turn. Well, yeah, like apprenticing as an audio engineer, sitting in with like ASAP Rocky on their sessions and my friends produced him and stuff. Um, and I wanted to get behind the glass and make electronic music. Because um, when I was at opera school, I'd be like going to, you know, opera classes and lessons by day and sometimes the concerts at night, but at night I'd be going to raves and jazz shows and indie and Afrobeat and mm. circus shows and like a whole range of stuff. Um, and then I came into gypsy jazz um, afterwards, like um, was doing that, but I was also doing my own music with a like electronic influence jazz. And then, more recently shifted into just pop and dance music, like tech house, UK garage inspired stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, there are specific instances in those that were actually really, really, really difficult. Um, and that's why I'm really passionate about um, the concept of finding your voice and, and, and the, the, per the personal inner work um, underneath it. Right. Can I ask you, uh, I never heard of gypsy jazz until I was looking into your work. Can you tell us like what, what that is exactly? Yeah. You, you may have heard the music and not known that it was gypsy jazz. So gypsy jazz is hot French jazz from the thirties and forties made famous by this legendary guitarist named Django Reinhardt. And, okay. um, Woody Allen uses it a lot right now in his films and you'll hear it in some commercials and like even NPR, uh, it's like background music sometimes there and like mm. people have it at their weddings and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, a lot of times it's taking jazz standards and then it's a specific style of music that it's guitar based mainly like acoustic guitar bass, imagine um, acoustic instruments that you could easily travel with. There aren't drums. Oftentimes they're not drums. Uh, traditionally they're not. And it's just like, like a, uh, a swing rhythm and then guitar soloing up and down uh, the neck of the guitar. And Django is the one who actually started doing that or made it popularized. Um, yeah. And Jimi Hendrix calls him his, his uh his idol in some ways mm. kind of started as a um as an accident Django Reinhardt was a Romani uh French and just like Western European uh musician he got in a caravan fire and lost the use of his pinky and ring finger um he still had them but he had nerve damage so he couldn't move them uh, with the same ability as before, but he could still um, bar chords with them. And so, because he couldn't move um, vertically up and down the strings of the guitar, he started playing horizontally. And mm. um, yeah, and the music's characterized by a lot of really fast, racy solos. There's this, there's a line in a song where someone sings, beautiful music, dangerous rhythm. It's like that. Mm. <laughs> That's cool. I, I love how the uh, like lifestyle informs the instrumentation and even like you know stuff you can travel with, you know. Yeah, yeah, but sure. For me, actually, just doing like like live electronic sets, one of the things that informed what I was going to actually use on stage was what I could carry in one trip. 
because driving into New York City and Brooklyn and all these places around here to go play shows, often I'm by myself. And I'm lucky if I can park a half a mile near the venue. So you just don't want to be making all those trips and leaving half of your gear alone and with, you know, who knows what could happen to it. So it was, <laughs> it was a nice limitation when I, when I was like, I need to be able to carry it all in one shot. And because you can expand your setup forever, you know, as I'm sure you know, you can just kind of keep going with stuff and adding things. Yeah. It's a big yeah, help. Yeah. I've bought instruments like this little, this little keyboard right here. I got to mm. fit in a backpack, Innovation Launch Key Mini. I mean, I also have a push now, but um, which can also fit in a backpack. But yeah, for reasons like that. Yeah, I, I have something very similar, the uh, Akai MPK Mini, for that exact reason. I don't yeah. think those were available. It's got a few more pads on it, which is nice. Yeah. But. Um, yeah, just that portability factor it does matter, you know. <laughs> I've lugged around gigantic guitar amps and drum sets and bass amps, and you know, the, it's not so bad when there's a couple other people with you. But you, you know, alone, I decided I didn't want any part of that. Yeah, ultimately, like, what's the cost benefit? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, so. It's been a, a obviously a pretty like long and interesting journey for you, and it's taken you over like it sounds like really I was gonna say parts of the country, but parts of the world, different areas. Yeah. Do you find yourself picking um, like different aspects, different influences from the various places? Do you do you see that in your sound now? Um, in some instances, yes; in others, no. So, um, for example. Um, I released this Cuban jazz album this year. Um, a few years ago, I went and created my own artist retreat in Cuba. And this is kind of with the idea of finding your own voice and your signature sound. And there's a story behind why this happened. Um, but with your question, yeah, I went to Cuba and I had no intention of making a recording. I just wanted to get away and do something for myself. Um, and I took Cuban piano and percussion lessons at this music school um, with these amazing musicians um, and ended up writing and recording a little EP. Um, so that was really interesting. When I was writing it, I wanted to also sample some of the uh like the piano lines, um, but I haven't done that yet. But the but this Cuban jazz uh, project was released. I ended up hiring a six piece band to record it. And we recorded in the studio of this famous Cuban singer named Pablo Milanes. Um, yeah, so it was quite an experience. Uh, so that has found its way into music, but I market that under my jazz name, Mary Alouette. So, um, yeah, Alark is the name that I use for, like, dance music, pop music. It's more appropriate for that. Mary Alouette I use for, like, gypsy jazz um, and, and that human jazz project. Um, yeah, so that, that's a big influence in that aspect. I think also for some of my earlier releases that were gypsy jazz and electronic music that I put out, I don't know, uh, they, under the name Mary Alouette, those had gypsy jazz with electronics in it. And for me, at that point, I was doing opera music. I, I had, like, freshly transitioned more from opera to gypsy jazz. And um, in my mind, in opera, in classical music, you have, like, the art song as a medium of a song. And... Um, in, in some senses, in my na in naivete, I was like, yeah, I can do my art song and, and still be, uh, I don't know, more relevant in some ways. And I guess you can if you're maybe in Europe or Canada, but in the U.S., it's more of a commercial market. Yes, it exists here, but it's a lot harder. And that's one of the things that I think is really important that I help other people with in finding their sound is like product market fit. Um, mm -hmm and business fundamentals in that way. Um, 
because I, I love the music that was made, but it was also harder to, I don't know, gain traction with it because it was hard to place yeah. um, stylistically. Um, but that is really, it is really cool because we would have like upright bass, gypsy jazz guitar, and then um, like over trap beats with like ASAP Rocky's producer, my friend Dodgers and, and Linus and like, uh, yeah. And then I would do some of the songs in French because that's what uh, they were in like, in the gypsy jazz stuff. Mm. Um, so yeah, so it fed into that way. And now I do a little bit more, I, I, I bring it into like one of the releases that I put out this year called Future Self, it's UK garage inspired dance track, um, has jazz chords. So I want like incorporating those elements. Um, yeah. So that's how you like tie that in. And I guess also just thinking about classical music, like the contrapuntal movement of different melodic lines. I don't think I'd go into it intentionally thinking necessarily do that, but it's just um, having just been in that for so long, just weaving a bass line with a synth line and then like a vocal sample line. Um, right. But I, I think, a lot of people do that anyway, and they just call it like writing hooks, but uh, <laughs> maybe or melodies if it's not a short little hook. Mm. But that thinking sort of seeps into the the water of your musical sensibilities and your your approach to things. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, the band sounds great. I saw some of the some of the performances and stuff online, and um, it's really it's. It's nice to see that, you know, just like um, that blending of styles. That you don't Thank usually you. hear that. I mean, upright bass and trap beats, like is, I honestly can't even think of another time I've seen that. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, I can't take any credit for that except for having found these people. Like they're all incredible musicians. And so mm. with their, their abilities, they're just able to be on the same page as one another. Yeah. I, I love seeing just like uh, these different disciplines more and more, you know, it's happening even in some of the schools, the teaching, like electronic instruments are being embraced now. Whereas I think in the past it was like, there was, there's so much like traditionalism that goes along with things. And now people are opening up to new ideas and it's just resulting in very interesting musical movements and sounds. Yeah. I think it's been in part because of the internet um, mm. the wild frontier of the internet, the wild frontier of the music industry and how um, there is less of the gatekeeping for building a career with music because people have more authority to build their own path. Um, and so it's kind of like a frontier. And I feel mm. over time, it's just worn in. Plus the people now who are in the institutions teaching things grew up with it more. Right, right. Them, it's more common. Yeah, I, I think like only makes sense. You know, I see that in a lot of young people, uh, and uh, especially like the high school students. I see like it's just like how they see things. It doesn't make sense for it not to be together. And, yeah. and a lot of interesting things come out of that. You know, we have like these like limiting beliefs for some reason that this has to be here and that has to be there. But um it's exciting to see that go away and just open up all kinds of new possibilities. Agreed. So in like, I, I wanted to ask you, I guess, um, in like finding like your voice, finding your sound, um, you've kind of decided to almost like find different voices or, and different like um, musical personas in a way. Um, do you find that to be um, like more freeing? Like, is does that like open up new things, or or is because I could see it going both ways, right? Where it could be like, well, no, I'm in this um, you know world. This is as this artist, I have to do this kind of thing, and then I can do it over here. But it seems like you find it actually like more um, conducive to a more uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a characteristic style and sound. Mm. 
kind of just developed out of necessity. So, for example, when I was doing gypsy jazz music in New York, sometimes I would start incorporating my original electronic stuff into those gigs. And then people who were fans would be like, well, what are you playing tonight? Like, oftentimes, yeah. Yeah. So they would just ask, like, what are you playing? Some people were more purists and they just wanted, like, the beautiful music, dangerous rhythm, jazz, uh, hot jazz. And then some people wanted it elsewhere on the spectrum and some people in between. And so, like, okay, well, how can I communicate what's going on? Um, just like if someone is in one band and then they're in another band. Right. Um, so that's how that developed. Yeah. Okay, so that gives you like those, um, all right, tonight it's this, tonight it's that. Yeah, but it has been more work. Hmm. I wouldn't suggest it for other people. I feel like my road would have been a straighter path had I stayed with one identity. So for example, like building a Spotify page, kind of, or like thing, like people, albums across different artist accounts. Um, hmm. So... Uh, I think having that helps is, is one of the things I'm passionate about helping other people with. It's like right. getting on their path uh, yeah. readily. <laughs> right. I, I think I definitely suffer from like this split personality. Like one day I want to do this, one day I want to do that kind of music. Um, hey, ambient sounds fun today. And then tomorrow it's like... 90s rock band style and you know it couldn't be like further from each other um and it can be hard to like kind of say well this is what we're doing oh it's actually like a folk song album <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah because people need consistency they, mm. they want to know what they're going to get yeah there's Listen. a few artists i can think of that get away with that um like beck to me yeah. it jumps out as one However, Beck built his name by being known with one style of music before people uh, yeah. could open up to him presenting more. By the way, I was at a concert the other night and I didn't know that he was there, which was kind of cool. Um, I don't know, fun. He yeah. was just like an audience. It was a very Saying small, you know. like avant-garde classical and like African-American spiritual mm. concert reimagining the traditional classical mass and there is a small number of people there so anyway that's a fun fact i've never been mm. in the before i didn't even see him i just saw a post of his that he took oh yeah <laughs> that's cool yeah and that like fits in what i'm saying right like he's he's all over the place he's into like all kinds of stuff and it, it definitely comes through in his music where it's you know if he's going to put out a new album i don't, I don't know what it's going to be and that's that's part of the fun of it but i can also think of times um where you know artists take that like crazy turn and you're like hey wait a minute what happened to the thing you do <laughs> you know i really enjoyed that so it's i could see for um there there's some point i guess right where you you reach as an artist where you kind of just get to do whatever you want but when you're building things it's important would you say, I guess, to have that identity and that, that thing you, you, you do, right? Yeah. Just thinking about it from a business perspective, like mm. yeah, as an artist, you are in business, your music is your product and people need to know what they're getting and be able to depend on something that's reliable. Mm -hmm. Right. So having consistency, they know what they're going to get. Yeah. Until you are able to be at a place where they're like, well, Beck can do anything he wants because he's amazing. Kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, that's cool. Maybe that's a good kind of bridge to uh, some of the like coaching and teaching stuff you do on, on the more like building your style and brand and business stuff um, with, with Supreme Sound Life. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You've got like a bunch of different programs and you even have a couple events going up that we should probably shout out and we'll repeat again later on. Yeah. So the artist coaching um, <laughs> program and the platform that I've created is called Supreme Sound Life. And as you said, like you can find it online at supremesound.life as opposed to supremesound.com. So it's the URL just for all listeners. Um 
And I coach female artists in pop and electronic music to, uh, in singing, songwriting, music production, like some of the artist development aspects in terms of identifying your brand um, and moving through inner blocks that keep you from doing the things, from doing all the things that, um, that are necessary with like on the practical musical side and then also with marketing and all of that. Um, and just like networking, all that. Um, and I specifically chose to work with female artists um, to create generally a more comfortable environment and a safer space for people to talk about different emotional blocks. For me personally, um, I don't always feel so comfortable if, in a group um, where if, if, if it's like a range of genders, I don't feel as comfortable expressing some of the emotional blocks that I have. Um, now I am more so, but not always. Um, and so I just wanted to create a safe space for that because it is so necessary for the work that I do with people. Um, but I have worked with a lot of guys too, and they're awesome. Um, and the, the upcoming workshop that I'm hosting, they're going to be in September. Um, it's one workshop. I'm ho hosting it on three different days. So for people's time, you can choose when it's convenient for them, but we're going through the necessary factors for developing your artistry and finding your signature sound. And there's three factors that I found that really do it for me. One is like, what is your desire? Two is what is the, the business like product market fit? Three is doing the inner work to allow yourself to step into that space step into your future self, which is a line from one of my songs. song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And um, so the workshop, we cover those and then I'm hosting, I'm leading a um, artist development program um, this fall. It begins October 4th and we go through singing, songwriting, music production, branding, content, marketing, networking, time management, financial management, and mindset for artists and personal growth and spirituality, like artist development 101 um, for artists that are already doing music. Um, yeah. Um, and that's called Signature Sound. Mm -hmm. Nice. I'm just making notes. So I remember to put this in the show notes so everyone can click on it and find it. Um, yeah. So that's cool. Um, you mentioned inner blocks. Um, and I think, <laughs> I find at least, like music making, music production, um, writing songs, even sometimes just playing your instrument. It, there's so much like internal struggle that goes along with that. Um, we're very vulnerable in these states to someone like, like it's so often like, you know, you have a musician and he's, Oh, play us something on the guitar. And that's like, they love to play the guitar. It's they want to play for people, but you put them on the spot like that. And it's, it's like terrifying, paralyzing. And there's so much at stake. Um, I guess, uh, I'm wondering, like, um, what what do you think um, are some things people can do with that? How how do they, without obviously like giving away the uh, entire curriculum here, but um, to f to deal with those inner blocks? Because again, like um, you mentioned, we said earlier, you know, it's it's hard to find your voice. It seems universal. I haven't met anyone that's like, yeah, you just do this, and that's who you are. And and the same thing with like these, like um, whether it's mental block, emotional block, or just. Uh, the self-doubt, the questioning, um, it seems pretty universal. And I haven't really met anybody and even people that seem to have it on lock all together still go through these things. Do you have any advice, any thoughts, um, anything to share for us? Help us out a little. <laughs> I'll share what I do for me. And I'm, I'm, I will never be a master. I'll never, I will never reach enlightenment, but that is my, my direction that I 
aim to take. Um, but I, I think um, a lot of it starts in childhood programming. So it's really looking at what happened? What, where did your beliefs come from? What is your belief? Um, so for me, I come from a dysfunctional family where there's like generations of alcoholism, mental illness, and things um, are passed out, not intentionally, like there's a lot of love there, but it's just unhealthy and no one ever knew. And that's also different generations. There's like World War II generation and things like that. And it just but it gets passed down. And so um, it's things that develop out of that influence behaviors and actions that you do. So basically you could have any neutral circumstance you can make anything, you can make any circumstance mean anything. But it's like, what is your thought about this circumstance? Um, and this is a tool I learned from Brooke Castillo from the Life Coach School. And she's a great podcast, highly recommend. Um, but she calls this the model. And I've seen this elsewhere too, but um, you have a neutral circumstance, you have any thought about that circumstance, and then you have a feeling that arises from your thought about the circumstance. And based on that feeling, you take certain actions and those actions beget certain results. Um, so it's really like, what is your thought about something? Um, and going back and, and doing really difficult, for me, it's been a lot of difficult um, work <laughs> and like a lot of the dark stuff, shame, grief, sadness, pain, that I had always swept under the rug because I had to in order to survive. Like as a child, you can't leave, you can't fight or fight. So you freeze. Um, unless it's like really, really, really bad and then you run away or something, but it wasn't like that for me. Um, and granted, my family is, is great. So um, I, I had no way want to like put a hint, like a tinge on this in any capacity. I'm very grateful. I'm very blessed. And there was this element that existed. Um, and so for me, like my journey going from opera to jazz, that was all codependency. I did it because I thought my mom would love me for it. Um, now I don't do that because, and they don't know, they don't come to my shows because they don't understand the music and I don't live near them anymore. But like I did opera because it's, my mom wanted me to do it, but I didn't really want to do it. Um, I wanted to do Broadway at that time. Um, I, I wanted to do electronic music. My, I would be in opera school, like dreaming of touring the world, being a DJ and singing. But I was so scared. And I didn't put full effort into being an opera singer. And for that reason, I didn't thrive in opera singing. And I would have mixed messages from people on the panels. I would have lots of encouragement from the coach at the Metropolitan Opera. But then I'd have a panelist at my school tell me to stop singing. And it, it was like this major identity crisis, a lot of, um, yeah, just a lot of confusion and self-doubt and like lowered my self-esteem in some ways. And, and like that went into gypsy jazz because I was like, well, I, I still want to sing professionally. What can I do? And I stumbled on a gig from a Craigslist ad and like one paid gig turned into another paid gig and I just went with it. Um, but I did it because of codependency. I was like, well, I guess in the back of my mind, I was like, well, I guess this kind of fits with what I want to do and it pleases the other <laughs> In air quotes, what, what is that? Uh, and now I'm realizing, oh, it's like that internal, like deep inner child, like seeking love and acceptance mm -hmm. instead of abandonment. Um, yeah, so it's look and finding a true, your true voice is about what do you want? And, and how are you going to walk, walk towards that or walk on that path? Um, and so I think, so it's a lot of uh, work in that regard and um, surrendering. And, and like, for me, it's been letting go of like self-criticism, self-judgment, um, which still exists, 
but it's definitely way less. Um, removing any stigmas around getting support from um, like mental and emotional support groups and things like that. Um, I used to be so judgmental of that kind of stuff when I was the one who had all these problems. <laughs> and now I'm like, I'm doing all the things. Well, not all of them, but like, hell yeah, because doing it, my life has changed in such like positive ways. And I feel like a different person. And um, in some ways, in some ways I'm always me, but um, I think there's a lot of beauty there. And it's like surrendering also, like coming to a point where, yeah, yeah, things can, I don't know, you can just get lost in like the ruckus and confusion, like a lot of darkness with that as well. Mm. And then, um, so the part with finding, like doing the practical inner work is creating the time, deciding you're going to sit down and um, just journal or um, do a workbook around this or like join some sort of support group or initiative um, and really uncover what are these limiting beliefs that are holding you back. Um, so that's one element of it with the personal growth and then also with spirituality. It's about, for me, I was raised Catholic, studied world religions. I'm non-religious now, but I, I like to think that, like I, I identify at this point most with Buddhism. Um, uh, I like to think that there's some creative power uh, like God or the universe that is just creating things um, and stepping outside of like the day-to-day -day life situations and looking at things from another perspective. So something that has been really cool experience for me um, has been exploring spirituality through plant medicine. So I did the Silawaska trip. So Silawaska is ayahuasca plus psilocybin mushrooms. So you've got like, deep like native tribal medicine with hallucinogenics for like an eight hour trip with a shaman and a group and musicians. And it was one of the best nights of my life. Um, granted I prepared for it um, like f mentally, emotionally, and then physically also. Um, but like through that experience, I saw that, for me, because everyone's experience is their own, but for me, I saw that the, everything is eternity. The, God is in you. God is in me. God is in this glass of, is in this glass. God is in this water. God, whatever God is. Um, and um, I saw myself alive throughout eternity. I saw... Um, I saw myself in different life forms as a, my roommate's dog, as a tree. I saw myself as me, a, like experiencing a life, like, a, like a death. Um, I saw myself as an abstract noodle in space and like, and I just find it really interesting. And I'm reading this one book right now, or it's, it's more of like poetry. So I come to it from time to time. It's called Emmanuel's book. And it's channeled um, content, like content, like we're definitely in like the digital marketing age, channeled content. Um, <laughs> it's like a forward by Ram Dass. So it has that, um, that slant on it from like psychedelic approaches to unlocking the mind and what is life, what is spirituality. Um, but in that book, um, basically they're talking about how this is a life that we enter. And I didn't first hear this concept through that book, but I do like this book. But it's like, we exist as, as light or something greater than what we are now. We can come into this space here and we're coming here to learn something and seek an answer. For me, I think it's just to seek love. Um, and I think having that perspective 
having like gone through this Siloasco trip where I was like, well, I'm alive throughout eternity. So I definitely, there was like death of the ego, um, which I'd been on that tip beforehand anyways, but more pronounced since then. It helped me reduce my fears. So it's like, well, if I'm alive throughout eternity, why not just fucking go for it? Um, like, what do I have to lose? Nothing. And there's this, another book that I read, um, turn to from time to time called A Course in Miracles. Um, Marianne Williamson s- speaks on this um, often. Um, but there's a line from this book that has helped me like find my voice and like do what I want to do. And it, the line is, um, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, let me learn to give the past away, realizing that in doing so, I'm giving up nothing. And it's, it hits on many levels. Like, I'm sorry, I have like my window open and there's like a fly. Um, and, and, <laughs> yeah. And this idea of like giving up nothing, meaning anything that I've been holding on to, it's like it can just slip through my hands. It's nothingness. And this life and this time here, it's like nothing. Well, life isn't nothing, but like what we think about everything is an illusion. Nothing is what it seems and like even we know like with Einstein he's talking about time how there is like our concept of linear time isn't real um to past present and future all collide in different ways uh, um and or don't exist um so I'm giving up nothing and and any let me learn to give the past away realizing doing so I'm giving up nothing it's like all of these limiting beliefs that I've been holding on to they're, they're not the reality they were just some illusion that i picked up along the way and for various reasons that served their purpose at their time and now i can be grateful for them because i don't want to punish myself for experiencing that i don't want to punish myself for taking a longer road than i wanted it makes me emotional thinking about it because it you know you want something so badly and but your own blocks, you can't see what is not helping you get to that point. You're, you have a veil over your head. There's a fog and you can't punish yourself because why would you want to live that way? And so it's like um, an act of surrender, meaning like I, and I came to this point where I had this like really um, this one moment a year ago where I was, I think everyone has definitely had a lot of difficulties with COVID stuff and and, in different situations and circumstances that have arisen like due to it. But for me, I I was getting out of this toxic relationship and I was like, how did I end up here? Like I consider myself to be smart, well-educated, got a lot of street smarts, all this stuff. And like, why, how did I end up in this thing? And, um, and that like also realizations about, my family and and it was like definitely a, a dark place and it got to a point where it's like you hear the term surrender and I was like well what does that mean and for me it was like I could I could give up all of my dreams in order to just be happy and um not that I will because if they're placed in you they're placing you for a reason but it was like that realization that there was something that was greater than the striving for something intangible. Um, and it was just like that surrender. It was like, just help me be happy. Um, and I think that element of finding one's voice is like, help me be happy. Like what, what would make me happy? What's keeping me from being happy and with whatever is keeping me from being happy. That's okay. And how can I step away from that and work closer to what I want and not being tied and tethered and like punitive and punished for that? It's like, that's okay. So I think um, all of these elements are useful in transcending from one version of yourself and stepping into the future self, which is the present. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing that I've been really into is with this meditation. So recent, like I've always 
not always. In the past few years, I've been into some guided meditations and visualizations and things like that. Like thinking like we know that the mind thinks in pictures. There's a lot of studies and books um, um, proving with the uh, psychology and how the brain will work to orient itself like a GPS towards whatever visual you set in front of it. So people like Olympic athletes will visualize themselves doing the thing. Um, so there's that. And there's a really good book on that called psycho cybernetics by Dr. Maxwell Maltz. And, um, so been into that, but even more recently transcendental meditation. Um, I didn't pay for the, like, however much it costs anywhere from like 400 to a thousand or 2000. I don't think you need to. Um, I do, I do believe in investing in oneself to have like a mentor and support, um, for me, meditation, well, one, I didn't like, I'm not sitting on a pile of cash. And when I am, it's like going towards my business or my music or me or other things for me, but I didn't really want to spit on transcendental meditation. So you can find resources online to do that. Um, and there's a podcast that I listen to that plays noise and like kind of guides us. It's called um, Meditation with Rafe, R-A-P-H, or Coffee with Rafe. And he has a YouTube channel and meditation channel. Right now he's doing this hundred day challenge. I don't do it every day. I'm not always consistent, but that's not the point. Um, the point is what, what is really cool about transcendental meditation. There've been a lot of a, hundreds of studies from um, Western institutions, which is what is cool about this because, you know, meditation is more of an Eastern approach philosophy but these Western institutions who are, that are more, uh, I don't know, like, show me the, yeah. And so yeah. they, they did all of these, um, studies and they're really supportive of it. And they show how the brain, the, the neurons connect in an entirely different way. The brain lights up and every, all these different pathways connect with transcendental meditation that doesn't happen through other types of meditation. Um, but for me right now, I, I've been starting to transcend just slightly, like sometimes, um, I don't know. I'm, 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 Am I falling asleep or am I actually like blissed out in higher consciousness? I don't know. Um, but it's you, so you have a mantra. Uh, people will also give mantras on YouTube. I think that a lot of times in, if you're paying for transcendental meditation, they make it seem very mysterious. Like the guru will give you the mantra. And then I also did some more research on that. And it's like, part of that is, um, because it's not about a mantra. It's not about a mantra. That's why not, they're not saying do this mantra or that mantra. That's not the point. The point is just any sound that's life affirming, meaning it's not like, ah, so any like simple sound, like, oh, um, or you could do like multiple syllables. Um, and it, you just repeat it and it's a vehicle. So I kind of imagine like Mario Kart rainbow road through space, like just riding this mantra, you know, and then, um, and then you just like kind of tune out. Um, yeah. And I think that's really interesting. And like taking this, this Buddhist approach to things as well, like this um, uh, idea of uh presence in the moment and mindfulness and like you know meditation is not about sitting down or lying down and doing the the, the practice of the one particular meditation that's one way to just you know familiarize yourself with the idea and the concept of meditation happens right now as you and i are talking this is it's just being present Mm. Uh, and so I think in terms of bringing it back to finding one's voice and, um, and one's signature sounds, like finding one's truth figuratively, um, the truth is the moment. Mm. That makes sense. Uh, thank you for sharing all that, that, that's that's a lot to, there's a lot to unpack there and a lot of valuable helpful information um 
I, I like that you trace it back all the way to childhood. I mean, I don't think anyone really escapes childhood without some kind of traumatization. It's just impossible. There's, there's too much going on, you know, and there's too much. Uh, we're so vulnerable as people. We're, you know, of all animals, we rely on each other. And especially as children, we will not survive without love and care for a very long time. And our society has even extended that, you know, where we are, we're basically adults, but we're still living like dependent children for many, many years. And um, with that, there comes a lot of psychological damage, even out of the nicest, best possible situations. It's kind of inevitable. Um, I think a lot of it is like, and I, I think as an adult who's supposed to, you know, have life figured out and everything, like a lot of the issues I run into more and more seem to be, whether it's anger, frustration, or sadness, or a lot of it at, underneath all of that is a fear a fear of being alone, being forgotten, left to your own devices, abandoned. Um, and some of the more comforting like experience I have are when I realize that I'm not, an, and it's kind of like, in a way, it, in a way, it's almost a paradox because, like, to find your own sound and be your own artist, you want to be unique. But a lot of it is in realizing, like, you are part of something else, and it's, it's like there's one thing, and we're all just like a part of that, like as if like the planets were just little atoms inside of some smaller thing. It's almost when you zoom out it and zoom in, it almost looks the same. Yeah. Um. So I found like when I'm in those sorts of states, I feel just at peace and comforted. And it's not, there's that fear of being abandoned and left alone isn't there because you realize you are, you can't be, <laughs> you are part of this other thing. And at the same time though, it's where maybe that like unique individual thing comes in is it, we need these like different ingredients and that's what we all have to supply this own thing to offer. Um, and you mentioned like surrendering and giving up and just sort of like admitting like to yourself that that is what's going on. You know, I think there's so much, um, you were talking about like sweeping under the carpet and pushing it aside and that's seen as like strong and tough. And I think for men, especially it's like, oh, you're not supposed to, don't let that get to you, man up. And all these things that we say to each other, um, are, they're actually not strength, you know, because you're not confronting it. You're not, you know, facing your vulnerabilities and your fears. And when I can, and when I can remember to do this sort of stuff, it, it, I wind up feeling so much better and more at peace when I just admit that like, you know, like I'm not pissed off. I'm actually scared. And when you see it, it's... It lets you understand it in a more real way and deal with it instead of just, you know, knocking against it in, in frustration and anger and aggression or whatever it might be. I've gotten a lot of that actually out of meditation too, myself, just um, observing what's going on in your head and just realizing that you, there's pretty much a non-stop movie playing in your head or, or a voice or someone talking to you. And um, I found myself, especially um, when I think about like my more adult responsibilities, like my job, my career and everything, I can find myself like getting really anxious, nervous about it. Well, I teach high school English and we just had the first day of school two days ago. So that's always like a sleepless night. You know? <laughs> like, oh, my favorite subject, by the way. Oh, cool. I love it because we can talk about this. We can talk about anything in there. You know, it all kind of relates. But I find myself sometimes going in this like downward spiral, like, oh man, what? Do, how do you get to be the one to stand in front of these kids when they're 14 years old? They're 
fragile little things, you know, then they're struggling and they're in the, one of the like most difficult parts of their life, in my opinion. I don't envy them at all and I wouldn't trade places with them. How am I the guy? Who did I fool? You know, when are they going to find me out? When are they going to realize? And through like just paying attention to your thoughts and meditation gets you thinking about thoughts, meta thinking that they're just thoughts. They're, it's, it's like watching a movie and this movie's called You Aren't Good Enough and You're a Fake. And I can almost like just take the DVD out and put in a new one. It's like, no, nah, you, you got here. You, you did this, you figured it out. You can, you can make it. And um, I have a, a poster on my wall in school. It's from Hamlet. And um, it's, the, it's a part where um, Hamlet is like, you know, he's all miserable about his life because his father was killed and his mom married his uncle and the ghost of his father told him that, hey, guess what? Your uncle killed your dad and married your mom. So he's pretty miserable and his two friends are like there to try to like comfort him or find out what's wrong with him. And he's, and they're saying how beautiful Denmark, Denmark, right? Yeah, Denmark, how beautiful it is. And he says, there's nothing good or bad in a thing, but thinking makes it so. He's like, yeah, you think it's beautiful, but I think it sucks basically. And yeah. he's just talking about like, things are just things. And it's how we think about it. It's the filter we process it through and everything that we experience in our world is filtered through our mind, through our emotions, through the way we see the world. And the thing is just the thing. And if you can remember that sometimes, I think meditation is really helpful for that, for just identifying when you're getting carried away by your thoughts, when you, they're running away with you, when they're taking you on the rainbow road, as you said, and mm -hmm. they're just pulling you along for the ride. And you, you, you don't even know it most of the time. And the stories we can construct in our head become our realities. And a lot of times they have no basis in reality whatsoever. And when I think about music production and making music and all those like vulnerabilities they are, a lot of it stem back to those fears of um, being judged or being um, ostracized or, cause then, you know, everyone gets that growing up some form, some worse than others, but we all get a taste of what that's like and how scary that can be. And I think that's why we get things like writer's block. Cause it's not that we can't do it. It's we're afraid to do it poorly. Yeah. And we get stuck and we can't make decisions. We can't move forward. Um, yeah, you have a good podcast episode on that. <coughs> you uh -huh. have a good podcast episode on how it's not writer's block. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I forget what I talk about sometimes. Um, yeah, I don't think it is. I think it's it's a fear, really. The more I I go through it anyway, it's like, no, I, it's not that I can't do that. And But it's the, kind of the beauty of music and, and making it and uh, being creative and artistic um, is it's at its best when you're not worrying about that stuff and you just let it flow. And so often I I hear people come up with ideas and I can be judgmental and be like, well, no, you know, it's just the one, four, five progression. That's kind of basic and simple. Like you gotta, and then like an hour later, they've just wrote like a great song around it. And I just feel like an idiot. Like, Oh, I would have never done that. Cause I'm too uptight. I'm, I think I'm like beyond that. I'm beyond one, four, five. <laughs> I agree. So yeah. many of my favorite songs are one, four, five, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, it's, um, when it's when it's working and when you're able to like get past that stuff and then just let it happen and um it opens a lot, i think a lot of um insights into just how we work not just creatively but as people you know when we're when i'm around people i feel comfortable with and i can i know they're not going to judge me if i make a bad song with them or say stupid lyrics that are corny or anything Usually that's when, when I have the freedom to do that, that's when the cool stuff happens. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. <clears throat> you know, that, that, um, the Buddhist sand art where you just create and then you wipe it away. 
it's like that type of approach to making music. It's like, it'll be, this song will end up how it's going to end up. And if it makes the cut, I can, may, then maybe I'll use it. But like, just to finish the song, just mm. make the sand art piece, no matter if it's anywhere in the spectrum from bad to good. Mm. Like, I like that. And I, I think I try to think like that when I do music, like nothing's precious. Like no idea is precious. No song is precious. No little guitar part. Like if they don't like it, it doesn't have to be in there. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. Um, but on the other end, paradoxically, again, I, I do think it's all precious. It's all cool. It's all interesting. It's all just magical that we can do it, that we have that possibility. But, um, to be, I guess it's like free from worrying about how it comes out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're going to just wipe it away, that, you know, then that's, some people I, I've spoken to really um, do well with that, where they just say, I know I'm going to delete this. And they, they will, and they just get the practice of doing it. Mm -hmm. And that becomes the point. Just yeah. The and, yeah. And I feel like there's a lot of, joy and freedom and creativity in that and that's something that some of my music mentors have taught me one of them is um sean Naughton. his his artist name is spider hound another artist is kate ellinger dot um and mm. ill gates from um in mm. his producer dojo is how i met spider hound um and I, there are a lot of in da vinci of studio sensei there are a lot of people who have this approach but it was novel to me when i first was introduced to it was just like gonna create um let's say you want to and now, now i use this with artists that i'm working with it's like let's say you want to make an ep and maybe you'll release them as singles but like you want to make four songs I'm gonna write um you know a multiple of that three or four times and we hear a lot of people do this all the time they're like we got to write 100 songs to get one hit kind of thing but it's the idea of going into it um just being like okay over and I did this in the fall like over the next few months I'm gonna give myself two weeks to write a song and like this is at like one or two hours a day like for producing writing maybe recording a sketch and it's not like the idea was not to have a finished song uh, like a like a final product song but like a demo that with a skeletal demo that can be filled in later. But it's like, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna complete the song. If it's, and then the idea is that by the end of whatever time that you set for yourself, you're gonna have a collection of work and then you just go through it with this like stoplight approach, like red, yellow, green. Um, and if it's on your computer or if you're just handwriting it, you know, yes, no, maybe. And then you just listen back to them all one after the other. And then you mark it, which ones will go on to the next round of further development, which ones, if they don't go on to the next round for further development, they have ideas that you might be able to repurpose or they might not be good at all, but the process of making them, you got faster at writing. If you're producing like your, um, you know, you're finding certain and sounds that you like, and let's say you're working with sample libraries, like you're, you now are quicker at knowing where to go, which sounds that you gravitate towards that kind of stuff. So it's still useful. And, um, and it's also really fun. Cause then you listen to me like, Oh yeah, I kind of forgot about that song. And like, I like that. Or, uh, yeah, I forgot about the song, but yeah. But like, it's, it's yeah. a, I don't know, it's fun. It's a fun approach. I do that in January when we do the January thing where every day you're just trying to make something and, and you know, sometimes you're just squeezing it in there because you didn't have enough time and you're, you're just worried about getting through it more than how good it, you don't have time to worry about if it's any good half the time. And I love that. And, then again, looking back, you're like, oh, you know what? There's a few things in here. If, if there's anything in there, usually that's more than what you would have had anyway. And yeah, then, because you'd be stuck on that one song, putting it on a pedestal and being like so emotionally torn about why it's like almost there, but you can't complete it before you're not inspired or like. Oh, yeah. Kind of 
Um, yeah, it gets too important when it's just yeah. that one thing and you can't, you know, it makes me think, all this makes me think like when you, when you do meditation, it's a meditation practice. When you do yoga, it's a meditation practice. And it's always, I, I, I think like before people get involved in those types of things, they'll say like, well, I'm not good at that. I can't do it. I'm not good at yoga. Like it's no, that's like the wrong thing. You know, it's a yoga practice. Like you don't, you're not good at it or bad at it. You're just doing what you can do and you're letting your body do its thing. And um, same thing with meditation. I think it's a good way to look at making music too, if you can, to try to at least save the critic, the perfectionist in you for later when you have something that you can actually work on and refine. But not when it's too early, not when it's this fresh new idea that hasn't even had a chance to really grow into itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, without judging the creation. And my mentor, Da Vinci of Studio Sensei, he's awesome. He's the controllerist and musical director from Miss Lauren Hill. And he's in this little mm. of sound and just, he's awesome. And he um, has a martial arts background. And so that's all about just, uh, you know, basically being the moment. Going and that's practice too. It's the practice, yeah. yeah. And it's like the, pra the practice of practicing. So recently I've got like my push right here. <clears throat> Um, I've been working on, I just put out a, a video of a live performance of my track future self. And I was working with Da Vinci to, like, you know, work out how that would go on the push migrating to this instrument from like another controller. Um, and also part of that process my work was just to, you know, take notes in a document every day. What questions come up through practicing this? You know, what things need to be addressed and fixed? And um, also how am I feeling? Um, and yeah, just getting in the flow, like um, the practice of the practice. It's not even about the music. And to me, that's very freeing. Yeah, like, like you said, it's free mm. too. I like it. And I think it, yeah, it just releases any positive or, I was going to say positive or negative emotion, but it, maybe it, it releases the negative, but not the positive. It's more joyful. It's mm. like very Zen, like in the moment, just not even thinking about what it means or um, like how it'd be perceived. It's like, I'm just turning this knob. I'm just listening to the sound. Mm -hmm. The world melts away. Yeah that getting the mind out of the way a lot of times is is through the body <laughs> and yeah i've i spoke to da vinci on the podcast and uh we talked about that a lot and um it's uh i've taken martial arts too and um one of the strategies that our our teacher always had in our classes is get us exhausted so like you, you're just for one, it's to mimic like maybe you have been like attacked and you're, you know, you're kind of like <laughs> discombobulated and stuff, but it's just to like get you out of your head and you're now you just do it without the thinking part. And one of the, the greatest things about, about the classes was always whatever I had in my life I was worrying about like you just blank on for an hour because you, you can't think about anything because you're exhausted and now you're like trying to fight and defend yourself and it, everything's gone. And then when class ends and you kind of like reemerge into the world, you have this like different perspective on all these things that were going on. You're not just stewing in it and just ruminating on it and getting more and more stuck like you can with music you can just i can't figure it out and you just but when you can get that break and move away and then come back with it with that new perspective it's so effective because again it's it's all it's so much in your head and if you can just kind of like <laughs> either beat your head out of it or just exhaust your head out of it it, it it's it's refreshing it is. Yeah. Never mind. 
Yeah, he's got good work. He's a, definitely, uh, we'll put some links to Da Vinci and um, Ill Gates too. Um, definitely has a lot of that stuff going on. That that kind of thinking, that philosophy, a lot of philosophy behind what he teaches, ill methodology, and uh, yeah. a lot of really helpful stuff. You know who's in their same boat that you and I were talking about before we pressed record? Mm. Laura Escudé and right. the trans youth. And, um, I learned of Da Vinci through her, um, and she's amazing. So for anyone listening that is like live performing with electronics, she is. I was going to say she's the guru. Um, she does, you know, programming for Kanye and JC and every household name just about and like her, her company, Electronic Creatives. But she also teaches um, a course called Transmute, Transmute Academy. But she's also really big on, I don't know if she does meditation. Well, she does do meditation and sound bath stuff, but also like a lot of the personal growth elements. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how nowadays it, how much she brings that into Transmute. I was in... Transmute. I went to the Transmute retreat, which was amazing. Um, and I've been, I, I know some people in there and they're all awesome. Um, so I'm, but nowadays I'm not sure how much she brings from like that personal spiritual side that is a part of her life that she'll post about. Um, but it just seems like a lot of these artists in the circle, like it's um, a big part of their being. And their time with music is incorporating that element of both meditation and also like serenity. I don't know if you ever watched Seinfeld. Serenity now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, well, it's a part of all our beings, you know. This is a big element, and yeah, Laura, you know, she's pretty much like the one who like paved the way for like all these like huge live concerts you know like how to do it and she's teaching it now and she spoke a lot about um the burnout that came along with that like because you know to get there you have to hustle like crazy and the hustle is is so glorified and it's it's a good thing hard work you know i think is is an excellent trait but not to the point where it's negatively affecting your health and you know she definitely came out and spoke a lot about that and how you need to pay attention to yourself and, and focus on that. And I think from that point on, you know, she's she's shown a lot of growth, and a, and she's sharing that a lot with with um, her courses and her workshops, which which is important because it's again like you spoke about it, like going back to like the roots and where all this stuff originates and being aware of it and being in touch with it. So that it doesn't consume you because it's like if you sweep it under the carpet, you're always tripping over it. Yeah. And, and it's, it, it was really cool to see her open up about that, which required, you know, strength to be that vulnerable and to like admit, you know, like, hey, this is not easy. This is hard. And uh, to make that okay is, is great. It, it needs to be understood that, um, you can't just grind yourself to the bone like that. That just doesn't ever end well. There has to yeah. be that other balance in, in anything, whatever it is. Yeah. So I can't speak for Laura, but I know in my own personal experience, I've experienced things similar to that. Just like, just like workaholism types of things in some regards. And for me, it stems back to, the same compulsions from the need to do that for love. Like, mm. let me jump through these hoops to impress like my mom or my dad at my, as my young self, but we don't, I didn't know that, you know, carrying it with, with me. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't think that goes away, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that like desire, that need, like that's always there. So it's important to, uh, know that and recognize it. It's. I think you're great. I'm sorry. I think I think you can still do the same things, but I think that that feeling behind it can fade. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like the you're being controlled by it, and yeah, you know, um, but it's 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 natural for us to want to be accepted and 
that that's we're social creatures and if you aren't accepted you know you didn't survive back in the day you know and that's i talk about that with my high school students because high school is one of those situations where you need to be accepted it's the most important thing in the world and and it's, it's like wrong to admit that even though it's especially as an adult you just see it like clear as day but when you're in it you, it's not as obvious it just seems like everyone else has it figured out and um but it's there is a definite um you know i don't know like darwinian <laughs> need <laughs> for that yeah so that's cool stuff. Uh, I love that you're doing it and that it's not just, um, I mean, look, it'd be great if it was just how to be an artist and, you know, get your music out there. But it's really cool that it's also this other level that is important that often gets missed and I think is often at the root of a lot of the struggles people run into. I know for me it is. So it's nice to see that you're addressing that and making that part of your program. And we should say, um, so supremesound.life, and you have the workshop coming up the September 21st, 22nd, 23rd, right? That's three yeah. separate days, right? Three separate days. The workshop is the same each day, so it's really just for, um, you know, availabilities. And you can find out more about the workshop at findyoursignaturesound.com. Mm -hmm. You can go there and, and it'll tell you more about it. But basically we, we go into these elements for artist development, like the music that you're creating, how you're going to have that fit in with like, your market, the business perspective and like how, um, how you're going to navigate that personally to be able to do the things. Yeah. Hmm. So find your signature sound.com. Okay. And, um, yeah. And it, and it, um, also there's a group program for female artists in pop and electronic music, which starts in October and it runs 11 weeks this fall. It's called Signature Sound. And we go more in depth through that and we write demos and these collaborations and um, all sorts of um, workshops and masterclasses and clarity on like your brand and, and up leveling in so many ways. So. Um, yeah, that's called Signature Sound. And people can find out about that at supremesound.life slash Signature Sound. Okay, nice. And of course, yeah. alark.com, so they can yeah. check out your music and, you yeah. know, hear Future Self, which we spoke about, which is cool yeah. how it like, it's almost like a theme song for what you're doing. Yeah, it ended up being that. And then I have another single coming out in October. It's called Nirvana. <laughs> and it's about Nirvana on the dance floor. It's a tech house track. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah. So it kind of sounds like yeah, kind of like Buddhist Nirvana. <laughs> yeah, it meets it meets Claude Von Stroke and Dirty Bird meets Dom Dalla meets Diplo, that kind of thing. All right. Wow. Yeah. So we got like synths and like gross, like kind of like funky synth bass and stuff like that. Awesome. That sounds fun. <laughs> yeah yeah it is fun so yeah thanks so much for taking the time to talk it was, it was really cool it's nice I, I really do appreciate you sharing all of that that you shared and and um letting people know um that they're not alone in this and that there's there's some ways uh you can get through this together so, yeah thanks You're welcome thank you so much and thank you so much to the listeners also yes Thank you to the listeners. I really appreciate everyone tuning in and listening to this show. And um, I hope you take some time and check out what Alark has going on on the internet on some of those sites. That's all going to be in the show notes. So check that out and have a great day. Have a great day.